Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third annual Harvard and Princeton Public Policy and Leadership Conference. The PPLC is a joint venture between the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, wherein we bring talented uh, freshmen and sophomore students from all across the country to convene on this place to learn a little bit more about public policy. So this evening, we're here to be inspired by those who we wish to be. Um, today's um, panel will be moderated by Dr. Gail Christopher, the executive director of the project, the Center on Government Innov Innov Innovations. Uh, we thank you all, and we hope that we all learn a little something about what we should be doing. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, and good evening. First of all, I want to applaud each and every one of you for braving this weather and being here tonight. Oh, Lord. Uh, we thought we might be speaking to ourselves, but we are, we are really impressed with your enthusiasm. And we apologize for our slight delay this evening. It had to do with the weather, but have faith, spring is around the corner. It's my pleasure, indeed it's my honor, to have been asked to moderate this panel this evening. Uh, I'm going to first introduce the panelists, uh, and I must say that you're going to hear a lot of firsts. And that's one of the challenges that each of our panelists have, have addressed in their careers, I'm sure. Uh, so I will unfortunately have to abbreviate. I could go on for the entire evening just giving you the backgrounds on these distinguished people. But I will be giving you a brief summary of their distinguished careers. And I'll start with Julius E. Coles, who is the president of AfriCare. He took on this important international leadership position after a 28-year career of distinction with the U.S. Agency of International Development. As mission director in Swaziland and Senegal, additional service in Vietnam, Morocco, Liberia, Nepal, and Washington, D.C. He retired from the federal government in 1994 with the rank of career minister. He went on to serve as the first director of the Ralph J. Bunch International Affairs Center at Howard University and the first director of the Andrew Young Center for International Affairs. Julius Cole's numerous awards include the Distinguished Career Service Award and the Presidential Meritorious Service Award. Welcome, President Mr. Coles. Thank you. Thank you. The panel is quite distinct and diverse in, in the fact that all levels of government are represented here, practically either in terms of background or present position. And we have some of the mayor of uh, the former mayor of Dallas, Texas, Mayor Ron Kirk. Uh, I have particular uh, empathy for mayors. I consider them the front line <laughs> public <laughs> officials, and he has a very distinguished career as well. He is the former mayor of Dallas, Texas, and also a former candidate for the Senate in 2002. Mr. Kirk is the first African-American mayor of Dallas, and in fact, the first African-American of any major Texas city. He brings over 20 years of diverse legislative experience in local, state, and federal levels. In 1994, Governor Ann Richards appointed Mayor Kirk, Ron Kirk, then the first African-American to serve as Texas Secretary of State. He was first elected in 1995 and served as mayor in 1995. Welcome, Mayor Kirk. Very good. Again, another first, Rosario Marin, the United States Treasurer. Secretary Paul O'Neill swore in Rosario Marin of Huntington Park, California, as the 41st Treasurer of the United States on August 16, 2001. She is the first Mexican-born U.S. Treasurer. She is also the highest Latino to serve in President George W. Bush's administration. Before taking this office, Ms. Marin served as Mayor and Councilwoman of Huntington Park, a city of 85,000 residents with a population that is 99% Hispanic. She was first elected to the city council in 1994 and was overwhelmingly re-elected in 1999. Concurrently with serving the citizens of Huntington Park, she worked for AT&T as the public relations manager for the Hispanic market in the Southern California region. Welcome, treasurer. Happy myself. 
for myself. <laughs> this is a good thing. <laughs> I've done a good job. Again, one of the lessons I'm sure you'll share with us <laughs> as the evening wears on. <laughs> and last, our, our distinguished panelist, Ms. Leslie Sanchez. She is the executive director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanic Americans. She looks and describes her career as a typical Latina journey. It began in the early 1900s with her grandfather's immigration from Mexico, and it continued through her role of selling door-to-door -door work, her way through college, door-to-door -door encyclopedias, her way through college, and eventually took her to her new post as executive director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanic Americans. As director, Ms. Sanchez is privileged to work with the Presidential Advisory Commission to advise President Bush and the Secretary of Education on the educational needs of Hispanic students. In addition, she is charged with forging alliances between public and private sector organizations to develop outreach programs that reach broad audiences and increase the educational attainment level of Hispanic Americans. Named one of the 100 most influential Hispanics in October 2001 by Hispanic Business Magazine. Welcome. So here we are tonight to talk, to think, and to gain new insights about the decision to lead. Our theme, choose to lead, diversifying the face of public leadership. There are many values that are espoused and associated with the field of public administration. Of late, you hear a lot about efficiency and effectiveness and performance, responsiveness and accountability. I know these are themes that run through your classes. I would like to add, and there are many others, who feel that equity is an important value that should be part of the public administration curriculum. Clearly, if we are to achieve the goals that are espoused in our founding documents for this nation, equity must be central, a central consideration in our service delivery paradigm. We will move closer to that possibility if we diversify the ranks of the public sector workforce. And this panel tonight will share important insights to, to talk about how we do that better, more effectively. And that's how I'm going to start the questions, actually. Um, you all have distinguished careers and unique roles. And I'd like to talk about, I'd like you to answer the question, how can we make public service more attractive to diverse communities? Um, it isn't at the moment as attractive as we might like it to be, and I'd like your opinion on what we might do to change that. And feel free to <laughs> jump in. Anyone? <clears throat> I can do that. You go first. Ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, we, we come to public service from different backgrounds in different ways, uh, and, and the journey that leads us to public service may be very different. Some people go to school to become that. Uh, some people like me happen in, to go into public service really unbeknownst to us. Um, I had started um, as, in banking, and then my son was born with Down syndrome, and I had to give up my career. I learned the importance of government when I advocated on behalf of my son and people like him, and realized how the important role that government place in the lives of the people it attempts to govern. That led me to work then for a governor and work with him for seven years. It also gave me the um, opportunity to see that at the local level, you could do a number of things that could not be done by anybody else. It could have a great impact. So uh, that's, you know, th th that, that was my experience. Now, I happened to come into this experience realizing also, and, and even though I come from California, at that time, there wasn't a lot of diversity. And uh, what, what we need to do is people like us that are already there. Um, I talk about how many of us have had to overcome incredible um, obstacles to be where we are. And our job can no longer be overcoming more obstacles. Our job has to be eliminating those obstacles so that other people like us become part of this wonderful world of public service. And uh, 
I don't think it's going to be easy. And I know you said two minutes, so I'm just going to be quiet. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a wonderful That's opening. Fine. Anybody else want to respond to that question in terms of how we attract more? Well, I came from a family of basically uh, public servants. My father was a public servant. My mother was a public servant. So I didn't know any other career. At the time that I was going to school, also uh, African Americans were pretty limited in terms of career opportunities. We didn't, couldn't go into business, couldn't go into banking. Those opportunities weren't open to us. In the early days, the federal government was looked upon as the great equalizer. And so I looked for a career in the government because that was where I would be given an quote unquote equal opportunity. And so my career started off as basically I had an ambition of working in the foreign aid business. And the government was the largest provider of foreign aid. So there was no choice for me in terms of career opportunities. The Ford Foundation may have been an opportunity or the bank. But in basically, it was the public service. If you're dealing with real resources to work with in terms of the development field, the public service was the way to go. Now, I believe in terms of the past 30 years, the percentages of minorities in the Foreign Service and working in international development haven't changed dramatically. At the time that I entered in the 1960s, we were about 3 or 3% 3 maximum at any one time. Today, we have about 5% of minorities or African Americans participating in the development process. So those numbers have not increased dramatically. And one may ask the question, why? And the question is, from my perspective, that we really haven't moved as a government, as a public, to really integrate the workforce as much as it should be. We pay lip service to equity. We pay lip service to equal opportunity. But in reality, we haven't made much progress in 30 years. I think people do career choices for two reasons. It's your passion. You're born with it or it becomes your passion because you have a child born with Down syndrome and you realize, I've got to do something to make sure this child has a great life. It's your passion because generationally you're born into the civil rights movement and you see your parents and families and everyone else doing it and you know nothing else but public service and that's kind of where you are. And generationally, most of us were born in this country in a period of time where in addition to the issue of bringing this, the equity that Gail talked about, Government jobs 40 years ago were good jobs. Uh, my father had a chance to integrate the post office in Austin, Texas. That was a big deal in 1950s, and it paid good money. Now, the challenge for us, I want to skip forward because I don't want to go as long. The challenge for us now and how we build on that initial passion is that you all are, are going to have infinitely more possibilities to earn money than our parents did or your parents did or we did. And so the challenge there is where then w government was attractive not only because we were carrying the banner of equity and opportunity and inclusion, but it was also a great financial career. Well, the, the challenge we have now is the, of the careers available to you, government, frankly, is probably the least attractive financially. Uh, and you have, frankly, parents that will say and friends that will say, you know, I didn't exactly send you to Harvard to come out and be a school teacher. <laughs> or city council person. You know, you're, you're the generation that should, go to Wall, that should go to Wall Street, to go to big law firms. And so I think our challenge now is how do we articulate and develop a passion-driven motive that you decide you're doing public service because that's really what you care about and what you're interested in. Uh, because the opportunities are there now, whether it's because of affirmative action or redistricting, you know, there's enough of models that we can slot people into. Our challenge is really finding people that really see public service as an ennobling profession, that see it as a calling, see it as a great way to make sure that all children have education, whether they're talented enough to go to Harvard or whether they need a little help like a Down syndrome child or a child with a hearing impediment or any other thing. And that has become a more difficult challenge precisely because the civil rights movement has been successful to the point that you all can now decide whether you want to go to Howard or Harvard, or whether you want to go to work for the federal government or whether you want to go to work for Morgan Stanley, you can now go to work for that bank. And so we have to work a little bit harder to romance the notion of what we do as ennobling, as meaningful, and to make that an attractive career for you. Yeah. We could really have a much longer session tonight <laughs> that we're going to be able to because of the time constraints. And we have the disadvantage of having started late. But So I'm going to move on to the next question. I'm going to ask Ms. Sanchez if she wants to lead in responding to this question. Sure. And the challenge, I think, that people of your stature as leaders have 
How do you balance your role as leadership of your particular ethnic community with your role as leadership of the nation as a whole or the community of, as a whole, the organization or the district? How do you walk that fine line? Uh, for example, I can imagine the challenges that Colin Powell must face. So that should be interesting, particularly to this audience. How do you manage that? I have a unique perspective in that. As the director of a Hispanic education initiative, I represent a very distinct community. And I have a voice in uh, an environment where my job is to advocate for Latino children. Um, but it's very interesting in talking about the previous question and this particular question. Sometimes I really believe the community calls to you. And um, whether or not you realize that that community is calling. As a leader uh, the, in the education that you have, in the positions that you hold, and so many times within the Latino community, people will see your role as someone that they can depend on, someone they rely on, that will bring them equity, uh, that will bring them resources. I had worked in uh, many different branches of government, and regardless of where I was, people would go, I was working for a judge in Harris County, and, and people would ask me, can you help me with my immigration papers, or can you help me get fair housing? Or, and they would come to me in Spanish and, 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 and plead, mm -hmm. because you were in a position where people really felt, they, made, they didn't understand the connection between maybe federal and state level and responsibilities, but where you're in this unique profession where the community calls upon you. And in many cases, it is that passion. It is that desire to, to, to um, do well and serve the community properly and make sure that our voice is heard that will drive you every day. And I think, and that's so much a case, I think, and I would always say about our Madam Treasurer, uh, in so many ways, we have been fortunate enough to go across the country and see communities and, and, and uh, visit migrant fa you know, families in the fields and, and in so many different environments. And they, they speak to her, and they, they speak to both of us in a way that they want you to share their, their vision with the president. Mm -hmm. They feel the empathy for that. Anyone else? Wanna? Well, there's another way of looking at it. You have a sort of a two-edged sword, in a way. On one hand, you're the representative of your ethnic community. And yet, on the other hand, you have to prove your value and worth as an individual. And I found with some 28 years of public service that at every level that I went through in life, I never had the joy of just enjoying the position. I always had to prove over and over again that I had the capacity to do the job at every level. Because people were questioning that. Can you do it as an African American? And people never let you forget your ethnic origins, even if you think that you may be able to do that. I don't think that's possible. So you almost always have to bear in mind that you are the representative of your race, yet at the same time, you have to prove your value. And you're never going to be allowed to just be yourself. You're going to have to constantly show that you can do it. Now, when I talk about the double-edged sword, you have someone like Colin Powell, who is a representative of his race in a very powerful position. But there are people out there in the black community who don't view him as a black. They view him as someone who's gone over on the other side, who's lost contact with his people and does not represent the policies and, and the helping to promote other people. I don't feel that way personally, but that's the way an attitude that exists. The people challenge him as a representative of the black race and say, no, he's not representing us, but yet he is representing us. So you get into this whole conflict of who's who and who's representing who. Well, I, I, I just, <laughs> I just say one thing, and I, and I know, I, mean, I think, again, a lot of this depends on where you are generationally. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't disagree with Mr. Coles, but I would say something to one point. I always ask students, always start first with an analysis of look at the job that you're applying for and first see yourself in that position. Do I have the skill set, the tools, the passion to be a great ambassador, a mayor, a councilman. Because at the end of the day, everything that um, uh, Linda and Rosario said being true, at the end of the day, you're judged on being a mayor. And people will be as proud as you can imagine that you are the first African American, the first Hispanic mayor of their town until you have a snowstorm and you don't remove the snow. <laughs> and then you're just a bum. You're the worst mayor we ever had. Now, there is always going to be that pressure, but at the end of the day, the only way you can get through it, and I would have to say, is you have to be yourself. You don't need to say a word when you walk in a room, as my father told me. When you walk in a room, there's no 
no confusion about who the colored fella is. So, you know, j just let that speak for itself. You go be a mayor. Our color adds value to what we do. And our color, our ethnic experiences can help us to prove that, yes, we can do it. But if you start trying to balance between what's it like to be a black mayor and that, and you lose sight of what are my responsibilities as a mayor, then I think that's where you get into trouble. Now, if you're in a unique position where you're an advocate for an ethnic group, uh, uh, as, as Linda is, I think that changes the paradigm. But if you're a colon pal or whatever, you go be the best Secretary of State you can be, and you just can't worry about the rest of it. Matter of I want to say something. Absolutely. Because I, 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 and I think this is very um, fitting that we're discussing this. Right now, we have a situation um, that we're facing right now as a nation. Uh, you, know, you have one of your former graduates, you know, Magna Cum Laude from Harvard, who is a Latino, who would be the first appointee to the Court of Appeals, who is far from qualified. <laughs> you know, he was the, the editor of the Law Review here. And yet, there are some people that not only do they claim that he's not qualified, but he's not Latino enough. He's not black enough, right? right. Um, and those are very, I think, very serious challenges for people like us. Um, for people like Miguel Estrada, you know, he's been, um, there's a double standard here. Um, he's clearly, no one can claim he's not qualified. Clearly, no one can claim that he is not. <laughs> <laughs> when you go to argue 15 cases before the US Supreme Court, then you, then you can say that he's not qualified. <laughs> but not before that. Um, so, but you know, the thing is, they don't want to, because he's Latino and he's a Republican, you know, that's what the issue is. Because well, he's a Republican, not because he's not Latino. So forth. But the double standard persists. And unfortunately, what's going to happen is that you allow this to happen as the nation to one, what's going to happen to everybody else. This is a perfect segue into the next question. But Gil, can I, can no, I no, 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 no. <laughs> I have to, because I, have to I say this as a lawyer, and I say this, that my opposition to Clarence Stein, and, and for someone who has lived, and most of these students here, the fact that you're at Harvard, somebody has told you, you aren't black enough, you aren't Hispanic, you talk, we, we grow up with that. My problem with Clarence Thomas, Miguel Estrada, is for someone to be at that level and to not articulate what, and be willing to discuss their legal philosophy begs the question of their qualifications. I think Clarence Thomas is singularly the most unqualified person to ever serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. And it does not, and it does not merit with me. It has nothing to do with him being a Republican. Because he's a there Republican. Are other Republicans. If he was a Democrat, we wouldn't even be having I, I this discussion. I disagree. He would have been, if he was a, if, for Estrada, let me tell you, if he was a Democrat, he would have long ago have been. Uh, but, well, uh, as I said earlier, this is the perfect segue <laughs> into our next We wouldn't even be having this discussion. <laughs> because it is about partisan politics. Now, right. both parties right. are actively recruiting um, ethnic diverse. I, I, for one, don't like to use the term minority because I think contextually it's a misrepresentation. But So both parties are recruiting ethnically diverse voters to their ranks. They're courting ethnically diverse voters. Some of the things that we saw in the last campaign were, were clear courtship efforts. Now, the question I have for the panel is, how can these parties recruit Diverse community within diverse communities with a with a degree of integrity and sincerity and genuinely engage more diverse voters in the political process. How can we move to a higher level, if you will, of recruitment? And what are your thoughts on that? Well, as someone who's not really been in the political process, I have my own view of that. And my view is basically, I don't think the political parties have taken minorities very seriously. Uh, they've given lip service. Uh, to the appointment of a few blacks, a few Hispanics, here and there. But in terms of major appointments and positions of power, in terms of the electoral process and the campaign process, it's just a drop in the bucket. If we're going to get serious about courting minorities, and I think they have to take a more active role, they're going to have to be more aggressive in pointing minorities in larger <clears throat> numbers to positions of power and responsibility. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. It, it's interesting when you talk about party, and this can get very bad very quickly. <laughs> I, I'm going to be very careful how I say this. Um, it, it's interesting with respect to Hispanic. I'm going to go back to that. 
Um, the, and the issue is the same, I would think, with the African-American community, is one, one party neglected you and the other took you for granted. Right. And it's, it's paramount upon our, our system that both parties are vying aggressively uh, for our community, for our vote, um, and offering all the different menu of options that that means. That includes funding candidates um, for public service position, you know, to, to, to run for mayor, to run for senate, with, and, and breaking some of the, the stalemates and some of the, the way that the system has been set up decades before we ever arrived, and now we have qualified candidates. The issues of Miguel Estrada, um, the issues of what kind of resources are they putting in the community, what kind of public policy are we moving forward that is going to benefit the community, which goes beyond showing up in our neighborhoods in October um, for both parties, and also beyond speaking a few words in Spanish. It is truly a commitment to understanding the community, reinforcing the message, and working to, to strive for stronger communities for everyone. The only thing I would add, I would, as someone who has run and who's run recently in both parties, and I, and I would say this, I am an extraordinarily committed Democrat and I will be. I think it is very important, and I think to some degree it's a tragedy, that for the most part the African American community is the only community almost totally disenfranchised when the Republican Party is in power because of our almost fanatical voting patterns, Democratic. Now, I happen to believe that's for a reason. We've earned that. But the only thing I would have since substance matters to me. I think we have, we aren't perfect, but we have moved far enough along the political stream that I believe Latino and Hispanic voters can make a differentiation that a Ron Kirk, who really cares about the issues that I care about, may be a better candidate for me than someone else with a Spanish-speaking surname who's going to oppose affirmative action, vote to cut health care for children, and I think substance will trump anything. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, what the parties, you know, that saying that all of our parents taught us that what you do speaks louder than what you say is also equivalent in politics. And just the optics of change uh, is the most offensive to me, to just say we've appointed a bunch of people of color, we're running a bunch of candidates, but if their votes are going to be hostile to the needs of my community, I'd rather have someone who doesn't look like me, but at least votes with me. You keep giving me great segues, Ron. <laughs> uh, the topic that I'm going to ask for now, which is quite hot right now, is the topic of affirmative action. Now, that could take us in many directions, but bear in mind, our purpose tonight is to talk about bringing people into public service. <laughs> and so the context for this particular question is, if affirmative action were to be terminated, what effect do you think that would have on diversifying the public sector in terms of bringing more people of color into public service? Let me say from my own experience of working in the government, that government has always had various affirmative action programs. When these programs have been terminated, then you always have the problem of no minority participation. So from my perspective, the United States has a long way to go before we can say that there's not a need for affirmative action in this country. Even though we've come a long way in 200 years, that 200 years still has not been sufficient to overcome the racial feelings and divide in this country. And that I still believe when you look at this audience, which is absolutely fantastic, this is what America is all about. But this is unusual. This is not normal. This is not the public service. This is Harvard. And if the country could get to this point, then I say there's not a need for affirmative action. But until it is able to get to this point, we need affirmative action to bring some semblance of equity to our society in terms of job opportunities and availability of positions. Not a silent panel. <laughs> well, I want, well, I'll, 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 I'll just try to be quick. Matter. I'll say what I said the other night, and I used an anecdote that one of the most Wonderful quotes. I was watching the ESPN, you know, late night TV during the campaign, and they were doing the top 50 athletes of the century, and they were down to Jackie Robinson, and somebody, everybody was talking about what was his impact on baseball. And the, and the simplest and most profound statement was that baseball became a better game when everybody got to play. Mm -hmm. Now, at the end of the day, America will be stronger, Harvard will be stronger, our schools will be stronger, our businesses will be stronger when all of America's children are educated and have the opportunity to do anything you want. And whether we like it or not, affirmative action has been the tool by which we have empowered millions of American boys and girls who are Asian and Hispanic and African American otherwise to be, that were previously locked out of the system to participate. 
And what I have proffered to my friends, those that argue that it's not time for, that time for affirmative action is over, is how do you defend our, any time we have discriminated in this country, what we have done is say to a group of people, take your talent and go elsewhere. The state of Texas lost because it said to Tom Bradley, Maynard Jackson, Willie Brown, you can't apply your genius here. So their genius went to California and you know, Kansas City and Georgia, and America is the loser when we close doors of opportunities. And I think we should do everything given the demographic shift in our country to be opening doors of opportunities, particularly in education, especially for young uh, first generation Hispanic um, boys and girls. With respect to that, absolutely. Anything type of discrimination like that should be eliminated. I think everybody on this panel would agree. We all have the same goal in mind. There needs to be inclusion, diversity. That's the issue. The issue is what method are we using to get there? What is the best method that we're using to get there? There are so many uh, examples of, you could call it discrimination, um, that are happening in, in classrooms across the country based on low expectations for ethnically diverse children, poor children. It, regardless of what is happening, it is happening in America. And until you do something to, to, re, to open the door and shed light on the fact that this is happening, that we can actually identify that and look for ways to solve that. We are doing that in education right now. Perfect example, English language learners, little children who are learning to speak Spanish, learning Spanish, learning to speak English. There are many years uh, that they did not have to be measured on their academic performance, only on whether they were learning English. It, it was kind of a, a trap for many of these children. They were never going to be academically qualified enough to live the American dream and do what you're doing here. That's a perfect example. We've eliminated that and are starting to eliminate that. So we have to ensure, I would say, that all these children are given the equal opportunity for a good education and academically qualified. But then it goes back to the issue of how are we holding institutions of uh, higher ed institutions accountable to ensure that the, that the student bodies are diverse. We're going to open it up for questions from the audience in a moment, but I have one final question. Uh, if you turn on C-SPAN or your Sunday morning talk shows, uh, you really don't see a lot of diversity in terms of the, the pundits and the experts on, on major issues of public policy. Uh, that's changing, but it's changing slowly. Uh, and one of the questions that we have for this panel is, what can be done, what can these students do to build the credibility that would enable them to play a major role in the American conversation, if you will, about public policy issues. What are those key strategies that they need to embrace that would help to sort of jumpstart them into that higher level of discourse in the public sector? Well, first of all, I'd say turn on Una Vision, <laughs> the Despierta America. You know, those shows, I, I think the most interesting thing, the fascinating month I've seen in this country was after the Trent Lott fiasco to watch a bunch of white men tell us what African-Americans <laughs> thought about what Trent Lott said. And for the most part, not see anybody of color have a voice in that debate. Mm -hmm. So you know what? I turn off the TV. I mean, they can't tell me how I feel about that. Uh, and one thing you can do is one thing you all do, you are an incredibly powerful generation because of your buying power. The commercials that we see on TV are driven because of what you spend, what you buy. What you watch makes a difference. If you don't see your views, your image reflected, turn off the TV. Turn it on to someplace else that it is. You can be opinion leaders. You have a degree from Harvard. You write a letter to the editor, it's going to make the print. You pick up the phone and call the head of your local news station, they're going to listen to you. You may not think they will, but they will. But use the power that you have. It may not be... You know, the, the results may not show immediately, but you have a lot of juice with the imprimer of a Harvard, Stanford, MIT education. Use that power. Another way of looking at it is that the elite structure of this society, we call it the old boys network, is basically white. And so white people turn to white people. That's what they're used to dealing with in television and C-SPAN, all those programs. When I was at Howard University, we had some of the most fantastic speakers you could ever imagine to come to speak to our students. We tried to get on C-SPAN. They wouldn't come to see us, no matter who we had coming to speak. We invited them, invited them, invited them, never came. You know, even head of the, one of the largest private voluntary agencies working on Africa. We've been in existence for 30 years. We can't even get coverage in the Washington Post. We had close to 1,800 people attending a dinner 
on Africa. And the next day, it was covering the Italian community. We didn't even make the social page. And that was one of the most powerful events ever held on Africa. You had Harry Belafonte on one side, you had Bono on the other side, but that wouldn't make it because it was a black event. So how do you deal with that? How do you rationalize that? But that's what American society is all about. This racism that permeates the society also influences public affairs programming and how the stories are treated in major American papers. Let me ask, did BET carry it? No. I mean, the other okay. thing we have to do is hold ourselves accountable. We have a great vehicle. BET Council's the only serious news program. And Trent Lott could have done more for news, pro I mean, did more for news pro More people watched BET to watch Ed Gordon's interview with Trent Lott than they'd ever watched before. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I mean, I hate to say it. We have a black-owned TV station that spends all the time. That's not well, no. but I mean, we had black run and manage, <laughs> but we spend all our time on infomercials, commercials, mm -hmm. and TV. I mean, we I, can affect the, that. Please. Okay. No, one of the things you know, I sometimes uh, question um, what is it that we really are attempting to do, because um, oftentimes we find that. Um, you know, I hope that even by this discussion, I, I, I think that you would want to be part of this. You know, there are some challenges, and you know, if we continue to believe that there's all this racism, and unless there are certain programs, we're not going to go anywhere, and blah blah blah. You know, uh, we will be doing exactly the opposite of what really we're attempting to do. Uh, yes, in fact, there will be some challenges. You know, but the fact of the matter is that you have proof that they can be overcome, and we need more of you um, here. And, and it can be done. And you know what? I'm very happy that you're here at Harvard. I actually came here for a program, the Senior Executive Sustainable Local Government. So yeah. this is familiar to me. But um, let me tell you, I had graduated with honors in high school, and no one talked to me about scholarships or grants, because I come from a very poor family. Okay, no one talked to me about that. I had to work full time and go to school at night. It took me seven years to get my degree. Many people have told me that I couldn't do certain things. When I started at a bank, I started as the assistant to the receptionist, okay? <laughs> because the receptionist let me know that she was the receptionist, you know. Um, six years later, I was going to be named assistant vice president for the bank. You know, uh, when I went to work for, for, for the governor, you know, it was like, well, you're only here because you're a Latina. Mm -hmm. Well, good, that's great, you know, because then I can represent a lot of people, you know. Uh, whether we want, wh whether we have one program or not, I can guarantee you that this this country, if in this country an immigrant can rise to become the treasure of the United States, let me tell you, their opportunities are there. And I'm not saying that it's easy, but it's certainly not impossible. And I don't know whether I could say that I was helped in one way or another by one program or another. I just know that hard work, dedication, commitment, that's what got me there. Because in this country, that's what really counts. And I don't, I don't know. I, I hope that you can believe. I hope that by the time we're through, you can believe that you too can make a difference for your community and for our nation. And it is through government that you can do that. That's a perfect opportunity to open it to questions. And I know this audience is raring to go. So uh, we, we, our time is tighter. So I'm going to ask you to identify who you are, where you're from, in terms of institution, because I know there are groups other than Harvard represented here tonight. And ask a, pose a brief question. And I'm going to ask my panel to keep your answers sure. to less than two minutes. Uh, OK, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Yes, I was looking at a show on. Uh, BET, the state of the black church. And uh, Condoleezza Rice and uh, Colin Powell were actually fully demonized by the majority of the, uh, the pastors there. Would, it, would you say that we would have a richer uh, dialogue if more minorities had diverse positions? Uh, uh, Mr. Kirk, you talked about African Americans being somewhat fanatical with the Democratic Party. Do you think it would be uh, if, if, if more minorities had uh, positions that are not the norm, would this, would this be, lead to a richer society or would it be more of the, the, the same demonized that I'm gonna demonization you know, that? I'll give you a one word answer, yes. 
Okay, but now remember, we're talking about public service here. I so mean, listen, I, I went online. I am, but I am. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I care passionately about politics, but I have such huge respect for Colin Powell. I have extraordinary respect for Condoleezza Rice. I happen to disagree with her on a number of issues, but it's important that any time we challenge ourselves, I think this debate over affirmative action is good for the country. If I can't articulate to you in an intelligent, responsible way why affirmative action is good, it shouldn't be there. And we should not be afraid. We should welcome the opportunity to stand up and rationalize and intellectualize why we believe in. That's good for us. I knew it wasn't a one-word answer. Thank you well, he, very he, he, much. He came yeah. back. He asked me. I'm sorry. Can I just ask, Would you oh. identify yourself? Oh, yes, I was going to. This is an infomercial for Thank the Kennedy School. Thank so Thank you. Uh, John Arrington, and I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. All right. Good. <laughs> Local city council. <laughs> hey. Okay, we're gonna, I'm going to alternate. Yes. Would you be sure and identify yourself and where you're from? Uh, my name is Iyad Latif. I'm a Middle Eastern Studies and Political Science double major at the University of California, Berkeley. And um, I'm a Palestinian American. And my question was, um, what advice do you have for Arab Americans and Muslim Americans that now that seek um, to work in the government here in the United States, given the fact that we now have to overcome not just the race barrier, but um, we're, the, we're now the target demographic for the so-called war on terror. And so, um, what advice, if any, do you have? Well, <laughs> I think the, the, the thing that Rosario says about hard work and sticking to it, American society recognizes its citizens no matter what their origins may be. And while there may be some people who may not understand the world and may not understand Islam and what Islam stands for, I think we have a duty over the long run to keep putting the issues before the American public and saying what Islam is all about. What is pa Palestine all about? What these issues are all about? Because there have been distortions in American history and life about the issues of a particular area of the world. So there has to be more of a balancing act. And the only way that can be corrected in the long run is for people like yourself to get involved, to be out there, to be a part of the decision-making process. And I think you can have an impact, but you have to stay the course. Thank you. I think you should be bold and arrogant about the fact <laughs> that you should be bold and arrogant that you are the greatest hope we have for peace in the Middle East. If the United States is serious about exporting democracy to a region of the world that does not understand it, it won't be done by Ron Kirk or anybody on this stage. It's going to take someone from the Middle East that they look at that believes has some understanding and appreciation of their culture. And that is the beauty of this country. We can speak to the world in its own language. Right. And you will be the best hope we have to be an advocate for democracy and change in that region. And I think you should champion that and have America celebrate that and embrace that as part of the president's mission to try to bring democracy to a part of the world that desperately needs it. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm Wayne Ho, MPP1 here at the Kennedy School. Um, I'm really excited that we have a panel here talking about diversifying public leadership. At the same time, I'm looking at the panel and I see that it's predominantly Latinos and blacks that are up there. So I'm wondering, one, what do you see as the future political empowerment for the Asian Pacific Islander community, which in many ways on the affirmative action debate to other political issues, the media puts them and conflates them with whites. And my second feeling, or second question is, um, how do you feel we can move forward with multicultural coalition building at the political level and cross these lines, whether it's political or racial lines between Native Americans, uh, Asian Americans, uh, Arab Americans, definitely blacks and Latinos? Um, I, I, I want to say something because um, uh, I, I've experienced this firsthand, uh, both in California and, and now with, um, with the president. Uh, there is a tremendous belief of bringing all of the of having the government reflect um, either the state or, or, or the nation. Um, and, and they actively uh, participated in recruiting uh, people of all kinds of uh, races and colors and flavors, you know. 
Um, this president, just so that you know, has appointed more Latinos than any other president in the history of this nation, has appointed a very significant number of African Americans, an incredible number of Asian Americans. Um, this president has done that. Um, and so far as the, uh, and he will continue to do that. And it's not just the administration. Um, he has charged uh, Jane um, uh, Cole's K, um, K. Cole James, K. Cole James um, from uh, the um, OPM um, to diversify the workforce. Not, it's, so it's not just the administration, but the entire federal workforce. And there is a mandate, and every single department is, is being measured by how fast they accomplish their goals. And insofar as, the, um, insofar as the coalition building, I think that more and more uh, people of different races and colors uh, are coming to the conclusion that there are a lot of things that bind us together within the minority communities, that there are far many more similarities amongst us than there are differences. Uh, I have seen where we're attempting to build those coalitions, and I think where we've been in some instances, I think we have been very, very successful. I'm very hopeful, and, and you know, I probably I should have been a cheerleader all my life. I look at the positive, you know, and I cheer for that. Um, I'm not saying that they're perfect, and I'm not saying that, that those coalitions are, are long lasting, but we're working toward that. There is a lot of hope. You wanted to respond? Yeah. I also think that there's a lot of work to be done in that area. There's a lot of misunderstandings between the African American community and the Korean American community or the Asian Pacific community. There may be misunderstandings between the Hispanic, Hispanic community and the black community. But one thing is for sure, the demographics of this country are changing dramatically. And that soon, people who are now the majority of this country are going to be in the minority. And so the question is, what has to happen in that regard? It seems to me we have to work at forming those types of alliances, understanding each other better. Blacks have to make more of an effort. Asians have to make more of an effort to understand, to build consensus on issues that we've done before. By ourselves, we won't have much power. But together, we could change this country. And that's what we need to work on. If I could add one part. This cross-pollination that is taking place, and it, it, it is still in its new stage. It's, you know, it's, it's such a new process for many. And sometimes, I know this with Native Americans, for example. We try to build coalitions with Native American, Asian Pacific Islanders, and they'll say, well, the Hispanic community is so much bigger than we are. And they think that we, sometimes they look to us to take a leadership role because maybe our coalition is bigger. Maybe we have a foot in the door that, that they didn't have. But ironically, I think it's imperative that all of us realize it begins with the leadership. Whatever leadership there is, in this case, our president that's allowed us to do that, or, or a president of a company, or whatever that may be. But two, it's, it's imperative that all of us recognize that each of us are equal players on, at this table. And, um, and that, that both political parties and that just the public service in, in general should keep that in mind. Thank I would you. just say one more thing. I just think the aftermath, September 11th, as tragic as it was, was a wonderful opportunity to bring Asian and Arab Americans into the political spotlight in a war, way before. Right or wrong, before, many of the battles for equality and equal rights principally had been fought by Hispanics and African Americans. And, and honestly, there was a little bit of resentment that if you approached the Asian and Arab communities, they would feel like, you know, that's not really our thing. We're more in economic development. Boy, on September the 12th, most of our Arab American friends say, okay, no more racial profiling. We get it now. We understand. But that is, I think, born out of that is an incredible opportunity for us to understand we're all in this boat together and that we can educate one another uh, and we can learn from one another and build on those similarities and the same goals uh, to do that. And I, I just think that there's an incredible opportunity there, particularly uh, in the Asian and Arab communities, to be a part of that broader vo voice and work to help us overcome those fears and find those commonalities. I don't want to neglect the microphones if they're in place on the second level. The lights are a little distorting. Are there people at mics in the, on the upper level? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Would you identify yourself, please? My name is Laura Wilson. I'm a second year public policy student at the Kennedy School. And my question is for anyone on the panel who chooses to answer. Uh, I listened a lot to you talk about affirmative action as defined by ethnic differences and how that enriches a community when we have a more diversified community. I wonder what you think about enriching and providing affirmative action opportunities based on class and not just based on ethnicity. I will say something enough. Um, 
It's interesting because uh, when we're talking about affirmative action, I think that's always been affirmative action. I mean, um, this school and many other schools, uh, one of the affirmative actions that they employ and have employed for a long time is um, the children of the graduates. That <laughs> It was affirmative action in that, you know? Uh, the, 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 well, yeah, I call it affirmative action in that yeah. regard. Um, I think that um, what uh, uh, the president has attempted to do and successfully in Texas uh, was what he called affirmative access. And that was allow people of all um, uh, statuses, if you will, economic statuses, um, to have the same shot as everybody else and the 5% uh, the top 5%, and whether you lived in a ghetto um, or whether you lived in, in, in a very, very plush uh, neighborhood, you were, you were guaranteed um, access to, to the state university. Um, there may be some faults with that. There, there, there may be, um, I find that, you know, I come from a city that has a 63% dropout rate, 63%, you know. Um, if one of them makes it to Harvard, that's really good, but that leaves a lot many more that will never, ever, ever get there. So for me, even the 5% or the 10% or the 15% or 20%, whatever it's in Florida, you know, it gives us that much more of a chance. It's far more, uh, provides that access um, that is, as far as I'm concerned, more affirmative. We're going to have time for just a couple more questions. I'm going to go to the other second floor mic and then back here. Uh, my name is Felipe Perez. I'm a second year here at the Kennedy School. And my question is in regards to the uh, recent primary election in LA, uh, where we had in, in Boyle Heights, Too we had this. Nick Pacheco, a strong community leader who was ousted from his city council post by Antonio Verregosa, another strong Latino leader, uh, talking about diversifying the face of leadership. How do we address this issue of leaders within our community more often than not attacking one another. Yeah, I actually think that that's really good. <laughs> I think it's great that we are able now to have enough Latino candidates that are really, really good vying for that, that seat. Or I think we're gonna see more of that. I want to see more of that. I want to see more Latinos um, um, being, you know, running against. I mean, we don't have a problem when two whites do that. You know, why should we have a problem when two <laughs> Latinos do that? You know, I think it's, I think it's, I think it shows that we're actually growing um, uh, politically. You know, I, I actually think it's a very, I happen to know both of them and, and they're very, very good friends, both of them. Um, I, it, was, it, was a, it was an interesting campaign and I followed it from, from Washington, but um, I actually think it's good. I think it shows that we're maturing politically when we're able to put out really good candidates out there. I, I, I have to say that I could not agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> when I ran for the U.S. Senate, I can't tell you how insulting it is if you get to the level as difficult it is to be an African American or Hispanic and you are carrying the banner for your party. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican. And someone comes to you and says, well, no, Rosario, you know, Henry says Nero's isn't supporting you. No one ever went to George Bush and said, well, all the white people aren't supporting you. <laughs> you know, why is John McCain running? And Tom, you know, I mean, with Anglos, they, if there are 10, you know, nine white boys who want to be president of the United States, we think that's fabulous. But God forbid if more than two black people want to do the same thing or two Hispanic. It is all about building a base of talent of which you have more choices. And I think that is wonderful. I, I agree with you. We need that. We agreed on something. <laughs> <laughs> Time for the next question. Let's keep going while we're ahead. Good evening. My name is Aaron McLeod. I'm a third year Master of Divinity student at Harvard Divinity School. My question is germane to my professional development here at the university. Um, what are some things that faith-based organizations, who in particular serve uh, minority communities, can do to increase the effectiveness and the efficiency of government on a state, local, and a federal level? Yeah. Good question. One word. Great. <laughs> Well, I think there has to be, one, an openness to faith-based organizations. Uh, in the past, we really haven't looked at them that carefully. We looked at them as being sort of out of the political arena. We didn't want to mix religion and government. There was a separation of powers. But now we're saying that these organizations can play a greater role, not only domestically, but internationally. And we're looking 
for what that role might be. And I don't think it's all defined yet. So I think there's a lot of work to be done to maintain that separation that we say exists in this country, but yet allow the freedom of these organizations to begin to participate in that process and help not only domestic, but internationally in development and in, and in the political process. I think there's a lot of room to maneuver and operate. This is a new field. It's beginning to open up with this administration really pushing these efforts. Aaron, if I may put in a plug, I don't know who's bringing it, but I think one of, you're going to have a forum or a study group in the very near future with a fabulous fellow by the name of Ernie Cortez, who founded a group and a movement in Texas called Interfaith. It's the interfaith movement in which they basically are getting churches to hold government leaders accountable, period. Right. period. Leaders accountable. Um, second, the first group to embrace the president's faith-based initiative was the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And notwithstanding our legitimate concerns about separation of church and state, uh, and I think, Linda, I don't know if you were joking about the fact mayors being on the front line, when someone calls you in the middle of the night and says, I've been abused by my husband, I have nowhere to go, they're not real interested in an interpretation of the First Amendment. They need you to refer them somewhere. <laughs> and more often than not, it's a food pantry at a church. It's a shelter run by a synagogue or a temple, and to the degree that what faith-based institutions do is do what you best. The theology of compassion is more important than anything we can do in government. And so never lose sight of that mission. What you offer most is what people need, food, shelter, love, hunger. And then it's our job to see how we partner government with you to provide that to people that need it most. Right, and the door has swung open. I think that's the most important part. That was one of the first things the president did was establish the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. And immediately upon uh, you know, taking a leadership position, they actually branched out into five different federal agencies and looked at every single discretionary grant, every grant program, aid program, no and said, can faith-based organizations access these dollars? And in some cases, there were small things they could change, and other things the president really wanted to know how he could open more doors. Um, at, for these armies of compassion and, and uh... I can't resist it's a teachable moment here and I think the question was so germane um, like any exercise in diversity and cross-cultural awareness and essentially you're talking about two different cultures the culture of government and the culture of the faith-based community you have to lead with your strengths to reiterate what the mayor said the faith-based community brings a, a unique set of strengths to help the government achieve its desired outcomes in terms of service delivery. So it's very important for members of the faith community to find a way to communicate those strengths and to translate that language, that unique language that you have, into a language that's understandable by people in the public sector. But the key is to lead with your strengths and to shore up where there are weaknesses, because there are vulnerabilities, particularly in fiscal management, uh, in some of the smaller faith-based organizations. And that's a, that's a guidepost in terms of any type of cross-cultural collaboration or coalition building. I'll put back on my moderator hat, but I just couldn't resist. <laughs> OK, we have another question. Uh, my name is Philip Curian. I'm a sophomore at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. And I have a general question for the panel. Um, what do you think in terms of the challenges that the African-American community faces in particular, um, the argument that the African-American community faces challenges that the Latino community, and even less so the Asian community faces, and how would you address the fact that the African-American community still faces these greater challenges, or how would you answer that question? And to Ms. Marin in particular, um, how do you r rationalize how President Bush and Republicans use the race of these appointees that you're talking about um, to justify their commitment to civil rights as opposed to looking at their ideologies? <laughs> well, First I don't know the, on the other point. I didn't, because I don't want this to be a, a referendum on, on Bush and others. But I, I mean, I can't sense we've had so many preferences with what the president's done. You know, I would go back to the vote. Of all, you can play games with how many administrations have appointed who. What's more persuasive for me than anything is in the issue that most impacts our lives. George Bush made John Ashcroft the Attorney General of the United States. And that ought to speak more powerfully about what his intent is policy wise. On the issue of African Americans, we have to learn from others. And we need to give, I think, the, 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 to me, one of the greatest opportunities that happens for us is the Census de Department finally 
has ratified what we've known, or validated what we've known, that Hispanics now have surpassed African Americans national in terms of numbers. We have to get rid of this hanging on to this most favored minority status. Get over it. Discrimination is horrible. We will fight it where it is, but let's learn. Let's learn from the, the struggles of other generations. We don't have to repeat the same mistakes over and over. There is so much we can learn from our Latino brothers and, and our and our Asian brothers and others. I mean, I, as mayor, I used to go nuts that there is not one black or Hispanic owned bank in the Southwest. And yet we will fight over which of us is the largest minority. Our Asian community has been in Dallas less than 20 years and they own five banks. Now there is a lesson that can be learned there from self-reliance, self-support and others. We should be teaching and learning from one another of our shared pain, but also our shared successes. And I want us to start building more relationships on a success model rather than on a pain model. Julius, did you want to weigh in on, on that one? I think there are some problems in each community. I mean, we may have our own problems, but there are problems in the Hispanic community, there are problems in the Asian community, and there are problems in the, in the African American community. What saddens me at this point is that there are now more African-American males in jail than there are in college. And I think we as a group of people really have to come to bear with these kinds of issues to see how we get more of our people into schools rather than into jail. And I'm not saying of what is the value system, but it's just a recognition of the fact. And the availability of males and the roles of the African-American males in African-American community and in society in general. There's something that has to be done about values and about feelings of education and what that carries us in this part of the world. I think that there's something we have to devote our own attention to really drive at this issue. Uh, one of the things that I would like to say is uh, the president believes in diversity. He believes in that, you know, and, and, and we should all be very happy that he has appointed as many people from diverse backgrounds, because that, in effect, is the essence of America. So um, uh, how, uh, how uh, I, I, I don't know how, how the question was, uh, how does he use race, or why does he use race? Right, I mean, he's using race as, as a proxy for kind of a diversity of viewpoint. He may have a lot of colored faces on his cabinet, but where is the diversity and ideology on his cabinet? Well, his cabinet, we have uh, a Democrat, uh, Mr. Mineta. He is, he is a Democrat. You know, that's, I think that's very good. He has uh, women. Uh, he has uh, people that, uh, different ages. Um, insofar as uh, um, Attorney General John Ashcroft, uh, yes, the president appointed him, but it was the Senate majority that appointed him. And at that point in time, it was, the Senate uh, was, um, uh, ruled by the Democrats. The majority was Democrats. No. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. <Nice>. That's right. <laughs> so, um, uh, what, what I would say is that um, that one of the things that we fight, and, and it is the ideas, and that's that's the democratic process, enables us to have, you know, uh, at one point in time. Democrats in the White House, and other time, you know, uh, Republicans in the White House, and and it is the democratic process that enables us to do that, and it is, and it is a war of ideas, and the American people have spoken one way, and that's, that's what it is. Okay, next question. My name is Salace Duncan, and I'm a student at Howard University in Washington D.C. Um, we spoke a little bit about the fallacy of mere representation, but I'm wondering, um, do you think that the very terms of public discourse sort of exclude mi minority groups? Can you give us an example? Yeah. Can you well, in terms of uh, how culturally sensitive uh, different topics may be and the sort of appropriate westernized way that we must present ourselves in the political forum, does that exclude um, different ethnicities from participation in that forum? Well, I've just, you've just proved that I don't belong in Harvard. <laughs> 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 
Well, I think it's a reversal of the question about the barriers in terms of, I mean, part of the raison d'etre for this conversation is the recognition that we are not participating to the degree that we might in both the public sector in terms of service providers and elected officials, and I think you refer to in terms of the, the public conversation, the public governance conversation. And I guess the other side of that would be, what are some of the barriers that keep us from being more engaged? We touched on some of that earlier, uh, but we might address a few. But I think, I, and, and like you were saying, I, I do I think that, that Rosario made it important. One strength, even though we have obviously very different partisan differences, one beauty of America still, it's still the most transparent, open form of government in the world. And if nothing else, I mean, there are very few barriers to people raising whatever. Now, now granted, at the, at, at the local level, we get the extreme of it. Anybody can say anything, and, any, and I don't mean to make <laughs> light of it, but I mean, there is n a, a no more open forum in America than the town hall, city council meeting. Now, one thing we have to do is educate ourselves in that process of how you access that. And you can do that. And it, to some degree, it is a learned process. But I would at least say, to the degree of having dialogue, there really are multiple opportunities to raise any issue in a public dialogue at the state level, at the local level, at the federal level. What I would like to add to that, it, it's, um, you know, I think that what prevents many of us from going to different uh, political, to, 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 to get into different political positions is the lack of money. Minorities, bottom line, minorities across the nation, unless they are self-financed millionaires, um, it's gonna be very difficult to get to, to, to be part of that uh, political system, you know? Um, it, and and it's, it's about money, you know? Uh, and I'm sure you know that <laughs> very well. It's, it's about money. The more, um, the more that, uh, People from different backgrounds become very successful um, in, in, in economic terms. Um, I think that we will see that there will be more of us, people that look like us, to really be part of the political system. In, in California, you know, we have a situation where if you're a multi-mega millionaire, you, know, you, can, you can do a lot of things to, to be part of the political system. And, um, if, and I think that that's true across the nation. I think that what we need to do is, uh, is um, uh, be more open to opportunities where um, people of different colors and flavors uh, will be able to participate in the political I have to say it's one made. thing, I mean, briefly, because the, the, the eight million pound gorilla that is unspoken of in this, in this room, the greatest threat to America, period, we don't vote. Hello. Okay? I mean, I'm proud to tell you, I was elected mayor with 75% of the vote. I'm ashamed to tell you more people went to a Texas Rangers, New York Yankees baseball playoff game that voted in the council election. <laughs> this past electoral season, I don't think any state in the country topped 40% voter participation. And when you ratchet it down to school boards, I mean, the, 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 if you want to change government, I mean, forget everything else we've said, vote. And the single most apathetic voting group in America is represented by this generation sitting in this, sitting in this room. You want to change the discord in this country? Forget everything else we said. Go vote. OK, we have a question up here. My name is Kelly Gasing, and I'm a second year student here getting my master's in public policy. And I'm actually from Dallas, so it's a particular treat. Um, my question is actually probably directed towards Mayor Kirk. Um, I share your conviction that ultimately substance trumps sort of the status quo, and I really believe one day we will never have to have these forums, and, but that's not now. Um, so something that really concerns me or a trend that is even more extreme to me among the many trends that inhibit sort of the, the best outcomes for governance is the trend in the Senate where you have to basically have just millions and millions of dollars to run for office, or you have to be really well-funded. And my question is pretty simple. I just want to ask you, you know, did you find if you want to comment on your experience, that's great, but did you come out optimistic or pessimistic that someone who's capable can do it, that substance does trump? Notwithstanding, and I guess every, I just ran as a Democratic nominee for the United States Senate in Texas, and, and, and right or wrong, we had one of those. In my family, we have a saying that we took from my six-year-old daughter, what was daddy thinking? Uh, <laughs> you know, all I can tell you is I, I am not a cause, I'm not a flag carrier. 
I mean, notwithstanding everything, I ran for the United States and Senate because I believed I could win. I believed I could win as a Democrat. I believed I could win as a black Democrat. I believed I could win as a black Democrat in George Bush's backyard. And the one thing I promised myself, if I did not win, I wasn't going to come back and say I didn't win because I was black. I raised $10 million. It was numbing. It was exhausting. It was offensive. I could have spent another $10 million. I still would have lost. People may not have voted for me in Texas this time because I'm black, but we'll never know because last year was different and that September 11th changed everything. Now, maybe it helps me that America, you know, I'm still last. Was Texas not ready for a black or Hispanic? And my simple answer, America didn't like Democrats of any flavor last year. It didn't matter what color you are. We may not know an answer to that. I believe we will get to that point. There will always be some people who won't vote for you because you're a woman, or because you're Hispanic, or because you're gay, or because you're black, or because you're tall, or because you're from Harvard. But I believe those people are increasingly existing on the margins. And that you get to a point, and every election stands where it is. One year it's a Democratic flavor, one year it's a Republican flavor. I know in spite of everything else, if you don't bring the skill set to the job, you don't get there. As proud as I was of being black, there were two other blacks who ran for the United States Senate. You never heard of either one of them for good reason. They hadn't done a damn thing. <laughs> I mean, and, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, you st and when I say substance matters, if I don't run as a lawyer, as a partner of firm, as a mayor, as a secretary of state, we don't even get to have that discussion. And the fact that we didn't get there this time, I don't believe was related to my ethnicity. It was just the fact that I was in the wrong party in the wrong time at the, at the wrong year. But You're someday just in we'll the wrong there. party. Well, <laughs> for, the, for, the wrong, for the wrong time. This no. is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, which is to bring us toward closure. Uh, we managed to buy a little extra time, but we really are going to have to wind it down. I've got time for one more question. Thank you. Good evening. And let me just say it's a true honor to be in the presence of such distinguished women and men. My name is Andrea Ambers, and I'm from DePaul University. My question actually alludes to a comment that Mr. Coles made a little earlier. He actually mentioned that the demographics of the United States is changing, but currently, unfortunately, we don't have any black representatives or any Latino representatives in the United States Senate. Now, with that, do you think it would be the responsibility of the minority communities or the government to increase the diversity in public leadership? Great question to close with. <laughs> I'd like to respond to that, but I think he has the answer. I think it goes back to something that we said earlier, that it, sort of the, the lack of, uh, of a will to participate into the political process by a lot of minority groups. And what I mean by that is I grew up in the civil rights era, and I was in Atlanta. And for us, voter registration drives was one of the most empowering things that brought about change in the South. If you got people to vote, you became powerful politically. In Atlanta, we changed the structure of government and put blacks into office that had never been in office. And that trend worked all the way across the United States. What's disheartening now is that the younger generation of groups don't participate in that political process. And as long as that continues, we're going to be frustrated in terms of having representatives and having people with political power. So we've got to turn that around. We may have to go back to the civil rights movement of the 1960s and mobilize people to vote because those re voter registration drives were very effective in that period of time. Now we just sort of laid back. Things have changed. We don't need that anymore. That's where we make the mistake because we need it more now than ever because the problem is still there. I, I, yeah. One of the things, I am very hopeful that we will have um, minorities represented in the Senate. I, I am very, very hopeful. And you know, let, let, me, let me just share uh, with you why. I think that America is, 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 is growing in the sense, is maturing probably, that will be the better word, um, where people will be accepted, and, and not because they're black, because but they, they have something that, that they bring to the table. And I, I will just share, um, I came from a city. I, I, I've always been a Republican. I've been a Republican since I became a, a US citizen. I represented a city that is 99% Latino, about 80% Democrat. And people elected me, and they re-elected me, um, even though I had been a Republican. And, and even though they're supposed to be not um, uh, nonpartisan, the reality is, at the local level, it's very partisan as well. I am very hopeful 
that America will see and we will, we will have the candidates of all kinds of different colors, of all kinds of different flavors. Um, and this Senate will eventually, I believe, uh, will have um, senators and, and women and minorities. Uh, uh, I am very hopeful America is maturing to that degree that we will all be embraced. Uh, I think it's something, it, it is a victory that Bill Richardson was elected governor. governor of New Mexico. You know, the challenge, I can't tell you how many hours um, the handful of us African American and Hispanics of my generation that had some political experience debated whether one of us would make the Senate race. And I mean, and I'm not, I'm not naive. I mean, my race was very much a leap of faith. But the one thing we knew for certain, if none of us ran, we didn't have That's a choice. Right. Exactly. And the challenge for many of us is the best thing out of the civil rights movement. Many of us were elected, but, but too many of us come out of a paradigm, Democrat or Republican, where you know you can be elected the mayor of Atlanta or of your city or Washington, but to make that leap from coming out of a, a district that's 60, 70, 80% African-American, Hispanic, and running in a state in which the ethnic population is substantially less, it's just different. It, and, and then the other thing is, for many of us, again, we are kind of first, I'm, I'm first generation post-civil rights. And there is also an imperative, we, we haven't talked about, the necessity of family. And God forbid, making money. Uh, that you are struggling with, do I use my, my Harvard MBA as my parents and my wife wants me to do to go make money or do I go make a bid for the Senate? But the other equation is we do have to have good people offer themselves for public service. And, I, th and I'm hopeful, I am hopeful that if we can continue to have good candidates and have right. candidates with the we experience that we're going to get to the point that we'll get there. I, I will, I, if I may, just, just uh, because uh, let, me, let me just tell you this. Um, in my city, for the longest time, even though we were 80, 90% uh, 90, 90 Latino, uh, we had been represented by um, five wonderful men, all white, for a long, long time. And it was only uh, four years before that we had the first Hispanics, um, before I, I, I joined the city council. And I was the first woman ever to be, to, 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 to be elected. So, you know, but unless we're there, unless we're putting, uh, we're, we're willing to serve and put ourselves through the grind of, 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 an, of an election, um, if we're not willing to do that, then uh, we're never going to get there. But I think we're going to be, right. we're going to have more and more people. So everybody's ready to run now, right? Everybody's ready <laughs> everybody, to run. all of you. Leave the yeah. private sector, <laughs> yeah. you know. Vote for yourselves. In yeah. terms of, you. yes, did you want to? Oh. Hit this down. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Very briefly. Very briefly. First of all, thank you all for coming very much. And you guys have talked a lot about running, but I think that one of the main selling points that we should get as diversity in public leadership is the fact that diversity means different voices get heard and different thoughts and ideas get put out there. And this is specifically directed to those of you that are working in the White House. And Colin Powell has done a great job putting AIDS in Africa on the table for the fact that you know he's black and this is something that impa impacts him. I want to know for those of you um, working in the White House, the United States Trade Representative has done a lot of work to try to block access to generic drugs, life-saving medications for a lot of different people. And I was wondering what you were, if you were following the footsteps of Colin Powell, if you were doing your part and voicing the fact that, you know, Latin America is going to be the next wave of the AIDS epidemic. Asia is going to be the next wave of the AIDS epidemic. Are you out there putting your voices, adding to the White House administration, putting pressure on Bush to say that, listen, this is something that affects my minority. Will you Stop, will you make the USTR allow access to generic drugs for the rest of the world? Because this is a voice that doesn't normally get heard because everyone is white and Caucasian and male and they don't care because they have the money here, but in the rest of the world, they don't. Could you All please right. tell us your name and where you are? Oh, from? I'm sorry, I'm Renee Shen. I'm a sophomore here at the college. Okay, um, now the, I'm gonna ask you to just, one person take that on real quickly. In yeah, I'll take it very quickly. I'll give you a great example. Uh, Research dollars, the tremendous, hundreds of millions of dollars of research dollars in the federal bureaucracy and government throughout, you know, throughout all, all federal agencies. If you start investigating and asking that there be accountability with respect to minority research, research in uh, diabetes in the Hispanic community or other issues that we know that are pervasive within our community, we have to hold the government as well accountable to doing that type of research and it's minimal, 
right now. And that's something that we've been evaluating in our office. We have oversight over those research dollars, ed education dollars, actually. But we saw research dollars that they're really not being used in the community. And we have to speak up and talk about that. But that is the kind of message that a President Bush wants to listen to. Because we have a very you know, limited time to serve, hopefully a much longer limited time, you know, longer time to serve. But it, it is our time to try to raise those issues and, and really make an impact. OK. Uh, and I do apologize for those who still have questions to ask. Uh, we do have to bring this to closure. The good news is that you have a whole conference for the next day or day and a half yes. to further discuss these issues. The bad news is that we won't be here to share in that process. <laughs> but I would say one message that came from this very clearly is that it's up to you to be, to become the change that you want to see. And I hope the role models here and their expressions of optimism and pessimism and realism <laughs> and all of those things have left you with a real sense that it is possible for you all to become presidents of the United States, uh, for you all to become secretaries of state and to do whatever is necessary to become good mayors, good governors, whatever it takes to help lead our country into the next millennium. I think we need to give our, our, our panelists a wonderful round of applause. Good night.